Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the possibility we have to be together again, to study together, to look deep and uh, see wonderful things in your word. We pray that your spirit will guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are still looking at the story of uh, this brave guy, Jacob. His story is a mix of decisions, good and bad, and circumstances. This morning we are going to look at this intersection, if you want, between decisions and circumstances. Jacob is running away from home, from uh, Canaan, running to Haran, where he has family. And there in Haran, at the well, a similar story that we know from the story of Isaac, more precisely, Eliezer, his representative, happens when he meets the bride at the well. Same well, or there were several wells, the location must be the same. Because Haran, the place where his family, Bethuel's, Laban's family lived, is the same city. So it's at the well. Whether it's the same well or another well, hard to say. But he happens, happens, well, again, God is in charge, but he sees that young lady coming with the sheep of Laban right there at the well, just like Eliezer saw the other young lady, Rebecca, at the well. So we can see some history repeated. History repeated is not just a literary pattern. If you analyze your own life, you will see that there is history repeated in your life as well. But then from that moment when he gets to Haran, his life is brought up to speed. Because the trickster, and Jacob was a trickster, now meets an even greater trickster. I mean, you look at uh, Jacob and you say, oh man, really? That's how you act? And then you look at Laban and you are shocked. What this richness or wealth hungry guy can produce. So in this area of the narrative, because remember the narrative of uh, Jacob's story has a turning point when Jacob, at the time of uh, Rachel giving birth to Joseph, decides to go home. That's a turning point, and from there you have a movement back, back to Canaan. So you have Canaan here and Canaan here. But in this area here, there is a pretty complex story after the wedding centered on the fertility of the wives. Four wives, well, two official wives and uh, two unofficial, because they are the maids given by those wives, Rachel and Leah, to Jacob. And one of them, Bilha, Bilha, who is the maid of whom? Of Rachel. She is called wife in one of the verses. I have not found a verse where Leah's maid, Zilpah, is called wife. 
But just like in the case of Abraham, we have polygamy. So we have official wife and then some addition to that main wife. Well, Jacob starts out with two from the very get-go. So pretty complicated story. What I want to emphasize here that this fertility motive or theme is repeated on the other side with another fertility story, this time the fertility story of the flock. And uh, you remember probably, if you've read through the whole narrative, that here Jacob, in his um, fight with Laban over what his share should be, throws in some very weird, I would say, methods of natural selection and even genetic engineering, or at least that's what it looks like from the outside. But the whole thing is, who's going to produce more? Whose share of the flock will be greater? Just like here, we have the struggle around the question, which wife will give birth to more offsprings? Right? So that same idea is repeated in a different shape. How do I know that indeed we have a chiastic structure here? Because at one point, Jacob really goes back. And here we have the moment, here the decision is made here. And here we have the moment when one day after he had spoken to his wives, he said, you're gone. And his wives are with him, so they are gone. And then Laban comes after them. So the same kind of fugitive that you have here when he arrives at Haran, you have when he leaves Haran. He's still a fugitive. Things will change somewhere down here. We have first a very interesting little chiasm. Jacob's agreement with Laban. And said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her thee, or you, than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. So you can see that you have uh, this sandwich between seven years for Rachel and again seven years for Rachel on the other end. And in between is Laban's statement, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. Question, is Laban really happy with giving his younger daughter to Jacob? Does the text suggest that to you? It's better that I give her to thee or to you than I should give her to another man. Uh, yeah. You're a better candidate than somebody else, maybe. <laughs> but mm, nothing really special. What Laban knows, however, because this is one month after Jacob had arrived, is that Jacob is a hard worker. So Laban feels bad about exploiting Jacob. And he says, hey, I would pay you for your work. I don't need you to, you're my family in the end. I don't need you to just work for me for free. 
so I would pay you. And that's when Jacob comes with the idea, yeah, I will work seven years for you, for your younger daughter. And he says, ah, better to give her to you than to somebody else. Obviously, in Laban's mind, the tradition of the place, which is a tradition of many places, actually, that the eldest daughter should marry first, seems to be there already. Okay, so seven years pass, and uh, verse 20 says, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had for her. This is the first time in the Bible when it's pointed out that somebody gets married to somebody because of love. I don't know if you noticed this. We don't have that Abraham married Sarai because they were in love. We don't have uh, that Isaac married Rebecca because of love. We have, however, in Isaac's case, that once Rebecca was brought to Isaac, and Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, who was already passed away, he was comforted and he loved Rebecca. But this is after the wedding, so to speak. So I think it's interesting that this is the first time in the Bible where it's indicated for somebody to be in love, I would say madly in love with somebody for marriage. And because he was so deeply in love, the seven years passed like a few days. That's what the text says. And then, uh, of course, he says, uh, my seven years are complete now. Uh, let's, uh, let's do it. <laughs> let's do the wedding. And uh, they do the wedding. And the text says, Laban gathered together all the men of the place, this is verse 22, and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went into her, and Laban gave Zilpah, his handmaid, to his daughter Leah for a handmaid. What we notice here is the trickster tricking the smaller trickster. You may ask, okay, how... Can this even happen? So somebody just brings another bride. We don't know all the details of how a wedding happened in those days. What I can envision here happening is, you know, in some cultures, you cannot see the face of the bride up to a certain point, and they unveil the bride and then there is a certain ceremony through which the bride is brought to the tent of uh, the groom. Some say Jacob was so drunk, he didn't know what he was doing. Again, that is all speculation. We don't have that in the text. The thing is, according to Genesis 29, verse 27, after the disappointment, because in the morning, he wakes up and realizes, no, this is not Rachel. He has a fight with Laban, and Laban is pretty relaxed. He says, Fulfill the week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her 
week, and after the week with Leah, they extended the wedding for another week. So now you have 14 days of wedding, and uh, the shy, layback guy finds himself being married not to one, but two women at once. That must be pretty shocking. Because it seems that right away the challenges start in the family around the concept of fertility. So let's see now who's going to be the better wife. Yes, Jacob loves Rachel. Why does Jacob love Rachel? The Bible says because she had a straight side or a stronger side and Leah's side was weaker. Now, there are two possible approaches here. One is that Rachel had beautiful eyes, beautiful, strong eyes. And, you know, sometimes you can see a beautiful young lady having a straight look. And uh, you feel like, oh, man, that is a look indeed. Okay? And you can also see people that have some deficiencies. In those days, you didn't have these. Because today, if somebody has uh, some eyesight problems, even in early ages, we can take that person to an optometrist. And they will prescribe glasses. And you put them on, and if you had a defect, it will be not as striking as it was before. So, some say, yeah, Rachel was very beautiful and had good eyes, and uh, she probably knew how to use them as well. The other one, the older daughter, had uh, some problems with her eyes. That's one interpretation. So it's a, an anatomical problem. But then there is another interpretation, and I tend to lean on this because of the Jewish culture and how the Hebrew language often works, when behind some language that seems to be dealing with some physical things, there are some character traits, actually. So, according to this kind of interpretation, you have two different personalities, two different characters. Rachel is the strong get-goer, you know, that temperament. And you have a, a young lady that is up to uh, do whatever it takes to reach her goals in life. And if you look at Jacob's profile, and he's a layback kind of guy, uh, the law of attraction seems to suggest that if you have a layback guy, that layback guy may be looking for somebody that is up to the task. Whereas the other sister, mm, she's softer personality, she need more time to make her mind up. And um, if you look at the first picture when Jacob is at the well, it's interesting that uh, it is the younger daughter that is at the well with the sheep, suggesting somehow that uh, this younger daughter is the strong daughter, and uh, she was courageous enough to be out with the sheep in the fields. So these are the two possibilities. In any case, the point is Jacob loved this one, and he didn't care about this one. He ends up having both of them because he's strict. And now the fight starts between the two women. 
and the other two women, Zilpa and Bilha, are brought into the picture. And you have uh, the chiasm in Genesis 29, 31 to 30, 24. That's the second big chiasm that you have on your worksheet. That centers in verse 15 of chapter 30, where Leah, Leah being uh, not the desired wife, but the other one, says, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? And she says that to whom? Leah says that to Rachel. But how come you took away my husband? Was he only Leah's husband? See the point there? So one wife throws this accusation to the other wife that uh, the younger took away the husband, my husband. But please understand, Jacob was not only Leah's husband. But this is in a story in which Reuben came home one day from the fields with something that is called mandrakes. Does anybody know what mandrakes are? It seems that those mandrakes that uh, Reuben came home with were some berries, some fruit of uh, a plant that, that was looked upon as aphrodisiac. You know what that is, okay? Every culture has some plants, some fruits, some substances, some meats with regard to what can serve as an aphrodisiac. And uh, Reuben, who is Reuben? Whose son is Reuben? Leah's, how many yet? Reuben, Reuben is the firstborn. Isn't he? Only that in the end, Judah will be the one that will take over the the firstborn role in Jacob's family. But it's Reuben, so Reuben is Leah's son. Reuben comes home and uh, Rachel says, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. That's when Leah says, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And then the next verse says that Leah hired a knight with Jacob for her son's mandrakes. Do we understand what is going on here? So what is happening is that... uh, Jacob kind of neglects Leah. And Leah stands up. And there's a fight between Leah and Rachel. And when Leah's son comes home with the mandrakes, and uh, Rachel wants the mandrakes, she goes off. And she says, hey, it's not enough that you've taken away my husband. Now you want the mandrakes, which are aphrodisiac, and you want to tie him even more to you? So uh, the bargain they are doing is, okay, I'm going to give you some of the mandrakes of my son, so what Reuben brought home, but you give me my husband back. Or, if you want, you give your husband back to me. (laughs) It's crazy. I'm emphasizing this because this is polygamy. Polygamy is not an easy thing. This was not a a divinely ordained uh, institution from the very beginning. 
in the creation story, you have uh, Adam and Eve. But here you have uh, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Zilpah and Bilhah. And, and you have the constant fight. And you have another little chiasm. You see it in uh, the section of uh, 29, 31 up to 30, verse 2 where you have uh, the women giving birth to different children, and uh, the central axis there is, and said, that is, Leah said, this time I will praise Yahweh. Therefore she called his name Judah, because he was praising Yahweh. Interestingly, that little chiasm focuses on Judah, Almost as uh, pointing out, hey, watch this guy, because this guy will become important later. That's a little chiasm pointing to Judah. But if you read the whole story about who gave birth to whom, how many children came from Leah, how many from Zilpah, how many from uh, Bilhah, and then, of course, Finally, here, Rachel gives birth herself, and Joseph is born, and then Rachel will have one more at the end of uh, her journey, because that's when she dies. The other one is who? Benjamin, right? So, a total of how many children? All, all four together. Well, with Benjamin included, we have 13, actually. We have uh, 12 boys and one girl. And I'm emphasizing that because, uh, uh, yes, there was a daddy's girl as well in the family. Even if in a patriarchal society, the focus, and most of the time, you can even hear that in sermons, when... Uh, they speak about Jacob's family, they will say that uh, Jacob had 12 children, which is not true, because he had Dina as well. So this is the messy story of the guy that by his name is a supplanter. He is supplanted big time. And um, life has it sometimes that what goes around comes around. And uh, Jacob has to learn the hard way how you feel when somebody treats you the way he treated his uh, brother Esau. Questions? Right? So the question is, why didn't Jacob kill Laban? <laughs> we don't know what was in his heart, but from the language he uses, we can see he's very, very upset. He's mad. Look at verse 25. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. So that's when Jacob wakes up and he sees it's Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Now, you have the possibility to read this in a very soft tone. I don't think that's what happened. And you can imagine Jacob as being a low-key guy. Because that's how he comes across from the rest of the story. But this time, this guy is mad. What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And he uses the word deceive, which is a derivative of his own name, the deceiver, Yaakov. Laban, very relaxed, he said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. 
fulfill her week and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And the story goes on pointing out that's, that's the end of this uh, chiasm here in verse 30. And it says, And Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. So it seems to me that Jacob kind of takes it as it is. Not that he is not mad. He's extremely upset. He's disturbed. Who would not be, right? <laughs> and who would not feel like, I'm going to kill this guy? But Jacob is still a godly man here. And I want to emphasize this aspect because we all go through disappointments in life. Some of the deceptions we experience in life are short-term and some are long-term. What would life be like if any time we suffer something major, we would kill somebody? Right? We can see that there is something with this Jacob still that God is working with. Going through all the struggles, all the deception and the, the disrespect that he experiences with Laban strengthens him and God is with him. And we will see next time in the story on this side that God is there. God is there step by step. He never gives up on Jacob. And here in this side of the story, the fertility of his uh, wives as well, you can see how everything revolves around God, even in the names of the boys as they are born. Many of them somehow have the significance, the meaning of their name tied directly to God's providence to God's provision yeah so if we the question is the age of Jacob when he gets married because he gets married to both women at the same time so to speak with a difference of one week one week for Leah complete her week Laban says and then one week for Rachel and um, if we start the calculation, assuming that Jacob was around 70 when he left home. And if you pull all the data together, that's the picture you get. I gave you less time, a uh, timeline with all the events, the major events in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph as well. So you can uh, do some calculations there. So roughly around 70 when he leaves home. Seven years pass, so that's 77, when he gets married. By the time he finishes his 14 years of services, that's 70 plus 14, that's 84, and then he stays six extra years working for um, the sheep, for the flocks. So this is on this side already. And uh, practically, you have 20 years total. So if he left home around uh, 70, he returned home or started the journey back home around 90. Does anybody know how long he lived? He lived 147. So he still has uh, a few decades ahead of him, almost six decades after he leaves Laban? That's a very interesting question. 
So uh, the question is, did the mandrakes work? The mandrakes being those things that Rachel was trying to bargain, to trade with Leah. So Leah would give uh, the mandrakes and uh, Rachel would give Jacob back to Leah. So since Rachel now got the mandrakes, the question is, did they work? Well, I don't know. I don't even know if it was real or not, because, you know, when uh, these qualities, these properties are attached in uh, some people's mentality to some plants or fruit or whatever, you never know if that's real or it's all just self-suggestion. Because people believe all kind of things. We don't have a description of how those mandrakes worked or not. I would like to show something, however. Chapter 29, verse 31, this is what it says. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and we have it in verse 20 that uh, Jacob did love Rachel, so much so that the seven years passed like a few days. So that was strong love, right? But the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. He opened her womb. And this is a, a light motive. This comes back again and again. When somebody conceives, it's not because uh, biology worked well or physiology was right on or uh, the pedigree of the two people was excellent or because the mandrakes worked. It is because the Lord opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. So it seems to me that Rachel being barren is a God thing rather than anything else. So God is working with a broken family there, broken in the sense of uh, less than ideal, in which God knows there will be some back and forth because Jacob loves one of them, but he doesn't love at all because she is unloved. Leah is unloved, the other one. So God intervenes, but then when finally Rachel conceives, this is what it says, verse 22 in chapter 30, okay? Then God remembered Rachel. And we know from previous stories what that means when God remembers. It doesn't mean that God forgot the whole story. It means rather that God puts something on hold. And now God releases the button. Okay? So in Rachel's case, God saw Leah was unloved, opened her womb, and uh, Rachel was barren. It's like God pushed the whole button down and he was pushing it all the way through that process of Leah giving birth and then Rachel giving Bilha to Jacob so she will have her, her children through Bilha. And then Leah answers, how does she answer? Okay, you gave your maid to him. I'm going to give him my maid. So total, we will have more. Okay, so through all that process, God still keeps his finger, his thumb on the, on the hold button. And then you reach verse 22, when it says, then God remembered Rachel. It's like, oh, let me release the button. So what I'm, I, I'm, I'm um, simplifying it a little bit, but what I'm trying to convey is that this, this conceiving and giving birth thing, 
is not what it seems to be, just the wheel of flesh or bodily desire. No, no, no. God is in the story. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. So God listened to her, which means that Rachel spoke to God. I don't know how she spoke to God. Probably sometimes nicely and uh, trying to uh, convince him, Lord, please, please give me a child too. And some other times she will go mad and say, ah, what have I told you so many times? Yeah. You think I'm exaggerating? No, I've seen that happen. When somebody that couldn't conceive would, would fight, I mean, hey, like, uh, you know, uh, mama bear. And uh, God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So God is in the story. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. I showed you, I think, before what Joseph means. Joseph means this. Plus. Addition. That's what it means. Yusuf. It's a plus. That's my symbol. So, uh, yes. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add. Okay, so that's the plus. Shall add. Shall add to me another son. So when Joseph is born, Rachel is with the other son in mind. Because she has to catch up. Because now Leah has uh, many more. So she, she wants to catch up. And she will have one more indeed. But that will be the end for her. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. So whether the mandrakes helped or not, I don't know. God did, for sure. That's a good question. When he gets married to Rachel, well, to Leah and Rachel, <laughs> because uh, uh, they, are, they are together there, does Jacob at that time give up his tricks? <sighs> Probably yes, if you think about the unethical tricks he would play before. Because after that moment, I cannot see Jacob doing any kind of reprobable trick, like supplanting somebody. There is something, however, that reminds us of how Laban tricks Jacob here. So in this side of the story, in the fertility story of uh, Jacob's women, Jacob's wives, the trickster is Laban. Laban tricks Jacob. Does that make sense? That's how it all starts. Over here, where we have the other fertility story, it looks like Jacob is tricking Laban. When uh, Laban asks him, okay, so now you are married, you have uh, both your wives, my daughters, you served the 14 years, and uh, Laban says, listen, I don't want you to leave, I want you to stay because I saw that God blessed me because of you. So stay with me, and I'm going to pay you. And uh, he asks him, what's your wages? To which Jacob says, hey, I want a share of the flocks. And the way he describes what he's asking for, to some people seems a little 
dubious, to say the least. The brown, the spotted, and the speckled, you probably know that story. To which this guy, the trickster here, Laban, says, okay, so that's, that's the plan. That's how you want to trick me. That's why I'm saying that it looks like Jacob is preparing to trick Laban. Oh, so you have, you have your calculations. And uh, keep in mind that at this point, Jacob is 80-something. In 80-some years, if you do shepherding, you learn lots of tricks. You know how to breed those animals. You know how to have greater productivity with your flocks. So Laban seems to be agreeing first, but then he starts getting out of the flock those elements that Jacob was actually asking for, trying to prevent the situation in which those uh, brown spotted and speckled will uh, multiply exceedingly and will take over the rest. But then Jacob again takes over. And that's when he throws in uh, that natural selection slash genetic engineering plan with, uh, we'll see that next time, with those rods that he does in a certain way and then in the end, productivity on his side is much greater than on Laban's side. Okay, so if you want, you can see that Jacob is still a very clever, very shrewd guy. He knows business. And he knows now whom he's dealing with. He gets to know in 14 years, you get to know uh, your father-in-law. I believe he learned a lot of lessons, but um, still, he keeps his, his fiber. The soft personality, the layback guy that processes and hits at the right time. Not in a negative sense, necessarily, here. I think he did his um, correct calculations based on his animal husbandry skills that he acquired throughout the decades. Verse 17. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock, which he had gained in Padanaran, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Is this the verse you are talking about? No? So this is the moment when Jacob leaves eventually, after he has a conversation with his wives. Now, if I'm getting it right, the question is, why isn't Dina mentioned? Right? Because if you just read verse 17... Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels. You have the impression Dina is left out. But maybe Dina was put on something else than camels. The camels in those days are the trucks, the pickup trucks. Okay? Maybe Dina was not placed in the same uh, group. We know he took Dina with him and the family from the stories that follow because down the road here, after they pass the confrontation with uh, Esau, when they meet Esau, there is a story in which Dina is the protagonist. Remember? So Dina is uh, the daughter of Jacob that uh, experiences a rape kind of thing. Very hard to say exactly what the intensity of that was really. With Hamor, I think is the name, one of the little kings of the area. 
So Dina was with the family. I'm, I'm reading from verse 21. So the present went on over before him, because Jacob sent a present for Esau, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. And he arose that night, so this is the moment when they pass the Jabbok River. The Jabbok River, so you can, you can imagine this, you have the Jordan River, and Jacob and his family are marching down this way. And here is the Jabbok River, and they have to pass that river. Okay? So that's the moment. And he aroused that night and uh, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and that's when the struggle happened. So the family is here now, and Jacob is left here alone, and that's where he has the struggle, and his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. Your question is great. Why isn't Dina mentioned neither here nor in the previous verse that I pointed out. I don't know. I wonder if there's any indication in the text that Jacob may have left her with family, but then how is it that she shows up here? Was she brought later? We don't know. At least I don't. So the question is, the fact that her name is omitted, she's not mentioned, does that mean that she was not as important as uh, the rest of the children? I would not read that in the text, because it's not in the text. I know we have that mentality, but I don't believe just a mission can be extrapolated to say that uh, she didn't count and that's why she was not there. There may be other details, plausible details, that can fill in the gap. So I wouldn't go there necessarily. Because later on, she was very important to the family, so much so that his bro her brothers killed the whole city. So she was important to them. The question is, wasn't Leah involved in this deception when Laban uh, used her practically to trick Jacob? Was she an active player or a passive player in the whole story? And that's a very hard question to answer. But if you think about it logically, it's very hard for somebody to be taken forcefully to somebody's tent with the sole purpose of becoming that person's wife. So some sort of complicity must be in view there. But how much we can blame Leah, there are cultural aspects in place there, the authority of the parents, submission issues, so hard to say. But it couldn't have happened without her, for sure. Right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the deep things that we have seen together. And we pray that uh, overall we will continue to see you working with messy situations, with people that can easily mess up, and uh, trying to bring the best out of each person and each situation. We thank you so much in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.